Let us sum up. What differences exist between the loan and the deposit? In the loan, the availability of the item is transferred and is lost for the duration of the loan. For example, if I lend my car to someone, I lose the availability of the car. If I lend a fungible good, I lose the availability of the fungible good. And I lose the ownership of the fungible good. Could you lend me a liter of oil? I seem to have run out. The borrower, the one who receives the loan, acquires the full ownership of the liter of oil lent to him. The proof lies in the fact that he consumes it. He uses it to fry potatoes or make a Spanish omelette. Afterward, his only obligation is to buy and return the equivalent in quantity and quality when the term of the loan concludes. So, in the loan, both availability and ownership are fully transferred. Meanwhile, in the deposit, take note, this is important, there are two possible theories. The first holds that because the specific molecules or parts of the fungible good are indistinguishable when the deposit is made, ownership is lost and is transferred to the depository. However, even if this is so, in no way is availability lost or transferred because the depositor retains the availability of the good at all times. It is simply that the depository will fulfill her duty by keeping the equivalent in quantity and quality, or the tantundum, always at the disposal of the depositor. The depository will not be obliged to return the very same molecules or particles of oil, or the very same grains of wheat or euro banknotes, but the equivalent in quantity and quality. The second theory holds that not even ownership is transferred because in the deposit of fungible goods, what is taken into account is ownership in the abstract, based on the equivalent in quantity and quality. Ownership does not reside in the specific particles of oil or the specific grains of wheat or the banknotes with specific numbers on them that the depositor hands over. Instead, he deposits and retains the availability and also the ownership of the good in the abstract sense, 10 euros for instance, regardless of the specific form it takes. The good may be one liter of carbonyl virgin olive oil, which is perfectly identifiable, or one quintal of wheat with certain characteristics. It makes no difference to me which theory you accept. What is important is that you understand clearly that in the deposit, the availability of the item is never transferred to the depository who receives it. Instead, the depository receives it with instructions to keep and safeguard it, and to have it always at the disposal of the depositor. And whenever he asks for it, the depository must return it. The equivalent in quantity and quality, in Latin the tantundum, to what was deposited. Now we will consider the essential differences from the economic standpoint. In the case of the loan, there is an exchange of present goods for future goods. I give up the ownership of present goods in exchange for having them returned to me within a year, along with interest, according to the category of time preference. In contrast, in the deposit, there is no exchange of present goods for future goods. There is no credit transaction. In fact, the depositor maintains the full availability of his money as if, or even more than if, he had it in his own pocket. Practically speaking, he says, what are my cash balances? Well, in my wallet, so many euros, at home, in the sock, and in the safe, so many, and in the demand deposit at the bank, so many. The money is mine, it is part of my cash balance. I do not want to lend it to anyone there is no credit transaction. In the deposit, availability is not given up at all, but in the loan it is. Listen to what Mises very clearly states in another of his works, The Theory of Money and Credit. Mises writes that the deposit is not a credit transaction because the essential element, the exchange of present goods for future goods, is absent. As a result, a loan includes interest, as we have just seen while a deposit does not include interest. There is no interest agreement. A deposit is assumed to be free, unless otherwise explicitly agreed upon. And if a payment is stipulated in a deposit, it is the depositor who must pay the depository. 
precisely so that she can cover the safekeeping expenses and not the other way around. So, if I place some money on demand deposit with a banker, I must pay the banker a sum, a certain amount per thousand, etc., for safekeeping services, for keeping the money available to me at all times, for paying checks written to third parties, and for providing cashier services when I present a bank book. The customers who make deposits must pay the depository, the banker, and not the other way around. If you see the opposite happening, you should smell something fishy, as we will see and discuss in greater detail. Now let us consider the essential differences from the legal standpoint. The first involves what jurists call the cause, or the compensation, or roughly speaking, the incentive for the contract. The loan is handed over with the purpose of transferring availability to the borrower, who asks for and receives the loan. If I ask for a loan to buy myself a house or a car, etc., I need to be given the money to use, to spend on the purchase of the good in question. That is the essential cause of the contract. The loan would be useless to me if the lender said, yes, I will lend you the money, but you must not use it. No. Meanwhile, the cause or incentive for the deposit is the safekeeping, as if by a good pater familias of the equivalent in quantity and quality to the original deposit. Please keep these 10 euros for me. The cause is safekeeping. It is a deposit, and you must always keep 10 euros in your wallet. Either two 5 euro bills or one 10 euro bill, etc., available to me, because I can ask you for it at any time. Therefore, the first legal difference has to do with the distinct cause or incentive for the contract. In the loan, availability is transferred. In the deposit, it is not. The cause is safekeeping. Second, in the loan, there is always a term, after which the good must be returned. It is impossible to conceive of a loan without a term. Furthermore, if a loan contract has no term, the law states that the competent judge must set the term. Meanwhile, the deposit, due to its very nature, does not contain a term because a deposit is on demand. That is, whenever I ask you for it, you must return it to me because I handed it over to you for safekeeping. At any time, I have the right to receive from you the tantundum, the equivalent in quantity and quality. In the loan, a term is set not only to specify when the loan must be returned, but also for the calculation of interest. Imagine I take out a one-year loan at 8%. Well, at the end of the year, I must return the quantity of money lent to me plus eight additional units per hundred. Third and last, what is the obligation? The obligation of the depository is to keep the exact equivalent in quantity and quality, the tantundum, at the disposal of the depositor at all times. In the sphere of money, this is the same as saying that a 100% reserve ratio is necessary. Meanwhile, in the loan contract, the obligation of the borrower is to return the loan at the end of the term, along with interest. However, a lender must not ask for the money before the end of the term, because the essence of the loan lies precisely there, in the fact that the borrower spends the money on the purchase of the car, the house or whatever, and until the term expires, he has no obligation to return the money. We would not be able to organize our lives if lenders could ask us at any time to return money lent to us. It would be like a sword of Damocles hanging over us, because the very reason we take out a loan is so that for a period of time we are not pressed for money. And we need that time period so that we can gradually save up money from our income to return the loan or so that our industrial project, or whatever our investment is, can get off the ground. A term is set, and until the term expires, we have no obligation. Is that clear? We must understand that clearly. For all of the economic misfortunes we are now suffering stem from confusion between these two contracts.